Good evening. Buenas noches. I am Melody Capote, Executive Director of the Caribbean Cultural Center, African Diaspora Institute, and co-moderator of this evening's discussion alongside my, alongside my comrade, Amy Adriu, Executive Director at Mocada. Tonight's conversation cannot be had without addressing the pandemics that have attacked our communities, those of COVID-19 and racism. I want us all to take a moment to acknowledge the numerous black lives tragically taken from us simply for living while black and to say their names. Rihanna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Jacob Blake, Eleanor Bumpers, Amadou Diallo, George Floyd, and the many others torn from this earth torn from their families and torn from their friends. Thank you. Today is day two in a series of conversations presented by the Creative Justice Initiative and co-sponsored by many of our organizations represented here nationally in these discussions. Last night's presentation served as a reminder to me of the love and labor of the many legends, leaders, icons, pillars, and institution builders of our national community treasures. And I wanna thank them. Amalia Mesa Baines, Lowry Sims, John Quick to See Smith, Margot Majida, Napoleon Jones Henderson, and of course, Marta Moreno Vega. Know that we honor you and continue on the paths you have each created for us to build a just and better world for our people. Our panel this evening is entitled Thriving Beyond the Performative, a community plan for small and mid-sized culturally grounded organizations. For this panel, we are using the word performative to address the behavior, response, and performance of and by funders in their attempts to act in times of crisis. Their performance in providing limited and short-term support, sometimes as emergency funding or in addressing issues affecting organizations of color and our community, communities is oftentimes short-sighted and not affecting the root cause. Historically, we have found that funding comes to our organizations when we become the flavor of the month. And so we're here to address the lack of long-term commitment and partnership when funders provide rapid response support that is often decided for us without asking us what we need first. We begin tonight's conversation with culture at the core. It is at the center of our building of institutions. Our organizations were not built to mirror the Eurocentric organizations where we are intentionally not included or seen, except for some distorted version of our history and stories. Instead, our organizations were created to be the voice, value, and reflection of our people. Organizations that were created to highlight our cultural contributions and creative expressions and tell our stories as authentic and valuable for, by, and of our people. Our organizations are the sacred spaces that reflect our culture and art of survival and not art for art's sake. And yet here we are in the year 2020 with black and brown people as the majority population in this country, with many of our, organization, with many of our organizations on the verge of closing or having already met their demise. How is that possible that there are fewer organizations of color today than there were in the 60s 70s and 80s. I have been in this field for over 40 years and unfortunately 
The results of the many surveys and studies done over this time has not changed much. The inequities in funding have not changed. The desire for long-term funding commitments has not changed. The need for a paradigm shift within the philanthropic sector has not changed. In the early 90s, we created the Cultural Equity Group, composed of culturally specific community grounded organizations to insist on equitable distribution of funds from both the public and private sectors and to move away from the small, restricted, programmatic grants that do nothing but continue to keep us small by design. I'm reminded by a comment that Juan made last night, quoting our friend Claudine Brown, who said years ago that you can't see results or impact of a funded program unless funders support it for seven to 10 years. And yet, nothing's changed. And yet, as many of us have survived, the question is how do we thrive? What is the plan for our growth and sustainability when our roles as community-based organizations provides much more than programming? Our organizations practice, co practice collective care, mutual aid, and provide safe spaces grounded in trust by our communities. And so as we begin tonight's conversation, we are not only here to address the significant role of our cultural organizations in our communities, because we all know that's what we do. What we do want to address and insist upon is the dismantling of the systemic racist processes that exist at all levels of an equitable and just playing field. We want to remind private philanthropy that their wealth was made on the backs and at the cost of the lives of indigenous and black people and that the public sector's failure to distribute public funds fairly and equitably is taxation without representation. It is time to pay up. It's time for cultural reparations. We must demand that the collections, artifacts, and items sitting in white museums be returned to us. We must insist on transformational versus transactional funding by shifting relationships with philanthropic partners. As monuments are being torn down, Let's tear down the philanthropic models and patterns that continue to keep us small. As I spoke with Ani Rivera yesterday from La Galeria, we were talking about investing in our community organizations that are the gems and in fact, the monuments of our communities. Fund us like you want us to win. I now introduce to you our co-moderator, Amy Andriur. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. We have been planning this conversation for many, many weeks. Uh, so to kick us off, I will introduce our panelists. Alejandre Duque Cifuentes is an immigrant activist, artist, producer, and educator with more than 10 years of production and stage management experience in theater and dance. She currently serves as executive director of Dance New York City. Amin Hussein is co-founder of MTL Collective, a collaboration that joins research, aesthetics, organizing, and action in its practice. He's also the co-founder of Decolonize This Place, an action-oriented movement and decolonial formation in New York City. Ani, uh, Ani Rivera is the executive director of Galleria de la Raza. Her work explores the intersections of community development, art, and social practice with a focus on creating equitable and sustainable communities whose practices center on understanding how power, access, and resources can be used in the surface of justice. David Martin has been engaged in Native American political advocacy, reestablishing traditional cultural practices, engaging in artistic issues in contemporary Native American art and culture and community-based organizations in New York for several years. He is an author, artist, and curator who has served many years as the chairperson of the board of American Artists, Inc. Amarinda. Kimmy Mojica joined Justice Funders in 2018 and currently serves as consulting director where they guide and support philanthropic institutions in aligning grant-making practices with social justice values and the just transition. They bring over 20 years of experience and steward positive change beyond traditional DEI efforts to transform culture, conflict, and practice towards collective liberation. Dr. Michelle Ramos is the director of Alternate Roots and a licensed attorney with significant organizing experience and a commitment to serving communities and individuals adversely impacted by issues of race, 
gender, disability, class, socioeconomics, inequitable laws, and systemic oppression. And finally, YK Hong is an anti-oppression trainer, speaker, organizer, and artist that has been working with organizations around anti-oppression, learning, leadership, and organizational culture since 1998. Welcome panelists. We're so excited uh, that you can join us for this enlightening conversation. But before we get started, uh, Melody and I would like to invite David to kick us off with an acknowledgement of the book. Uh, hello. <clears throat> hello, my name is David Martin member of the Shinnecock Montauk Nation of New York and the Night Chiricahua Apache Tribe, a chairperson of the American founded in 1980 and founder of Amarin in its inception to the stewards of the New York of contemporary business organization individual performance and media to a broad audience. When we engage or with funders, we always seek to advocate for real practical change and focus less on the more symbolic gestures, no matter how well-meaning. That's why at the outset, we customarily stress that Native Americans of this area do have contemporary lives and continue to maintain their individual communities today. Our people are not figures of the past, but have vital living traditions. Having said that, New York City is the territory of Native Americans who've been here at least 10,000 years, including the Month Nation, the Haudenosaunee Iroquois Confederacy consisting of the Mohawk, Onondaga, Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, and Tuscarora. In addition, this is also the land of the Matenecock, Canarsie, Rockaway, Massapeque, Setauket, Okachog, Shinnecock, and Montauk Peas. Today, it is our great honor to thank the founders of the CEG Cultural Equity Group and their visionary mission, which has had a deeply positive impact on our work and its importance in telling our own stories. We give sincere gratitude to Melody and A convening this important meeting and for the invitation to participate. David, are you having trouble with internet? Because we're having a hard time hearing you and we were going to go next, but I want to make sure you hear us and that we hear you. Oh, very well. You couldn't hear me? It's a very bad connection. Oh, you were unable to hear? You keep getting cut off. Hello? So maybe let's do, let's give you a minute to see what's going on on your end. And a Amy, do you think maybe we go on to the next panel and then come back to David? We don't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, I was saying, yes, yeah, sure. We can start with Alejandro. Because it's really hard. It's really hard to, um, it's really hard to, to follow what's going on with him. I have next on the panel, Annie, is that correct? Or was this? Oh yes, that's, that's right. That's Annie. Right. So, Annie, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay, terrific. Let's move on to our conversation. We'll come back to David in a bit. I'm hoping that it'll clear up on his end. But Annie, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Galeria de la Raza. We've spoken quite a bit over the last few days talking about uh, erasure, displacement, sustainability. How do we sustain our practice within the community through the figure if we talked about a 20 to 100 year plan? Talk to us a little bit about what is happening with La Galeria and the um, importance of space and ownership in the face of gentrification. And remind us where you're based. 
Yeah. Well, first I want to thank you, thank everyone, you know, Creative Justice Initiative for bringing us together for this, you know, rich conversation and, and to share what we've been doing and to hopefully envision the future. Um, I do want to um, say a few words in Spanish. Um, primeramente, muchas gracias a la audiencia que nos está uh, viendo y sincronizando con nosotros. Uh, esperemos que esta sea una conversación rica, que podamos compartir lo que se ha estado haciendo uh, con la Galería de la Raza y uh, que juntos podamos seguir una visión para el futuro. Los invito a los que tal vez tienen audiencia que hablan español y que quieren estar más involucrados, mi presentación va a ser en inglés, pero los invito a que me llamen y podemos tener y seguir conversando. Um, anyway, thank you. Um, so, you know, first, before we sort of get into what we can do and where we been going, I think it's really important to set in the context of the state, the state of our communities, um, particularly through the local lens of San Francisco um, Bay Area. Uh, historically, the Latinx community has contributed to San Francisco's success. Um, and um, yet, uh, we know that our communities uh, currently are facing racial health, economic, education disparities. Um, it's really important to note that in SF alone, the Latinx community represents 51% of the active COVID cases, while yet we're only 15% of the population. So as um, we deal with the severe demographic shifts, um, which have drastically changed our city and disproportionately displaced the you know, low-income Latino residents, immigrants, and people of color, um, in the city today, we have one of the highest uh, levels of income inequality of any major city. And I think it's worth sharing some of the data that informs us and you know, continues to showcase how disproportionately we've been impacted, not just from COVID, but displacement and you know, economic disinvestment. In the Mission District alone, we've had over 8,000 Latinx families lose their homes. Um, since 2000, the year 2000. Uh, evictions continue to be on the rise. In 2015, we had 472 evictions in the mission. In 2016, that rose to 589. And consistently every year, we see a 25% increase on evictions. Um, you know, before COVID, a uh, one bedroom apartment in San Francisco was roughly about $3,400 a month. After COVID, it's 2,900, still a high price. So, you know, in the midst of all this happening, there's a, you know, uh, pathway for 18 luxury housing projects in the Mission District with six affordable housings in the pipeline. So one of the key questions that keeps our communities up at night is how will our families continue to afford to live in our neighborhoods? How can we be served, culturally served, um, to recover from COVID? And the reality is that a lot of our cultural institutions, these monument institutions, have also been experiencing the same displacement. We're getting ready for another round of displacement in the spiraling real estate market. And this is the case for Galeria in 2018. We were evicted from our 40-year-old home where we were on a month-to-month -month verbal rental agreement. So it is, it's really important to understand the framework of what we're doing day in and day out. Um, however, we believe, given why we were founded, we believe that culture is never separate from the undoing of these inequalities. You know, it is at the center. Um, and born out of the legacy of cultural activism, our work is rooted in social inclusion and justice. You know, we our community art space that is central to navigating these complex uh, intersections of urban development, social inequality, affordable housing, and the historical cultural legacies of our communities of color. Uh, we continue to do so by supporting artists whose work is committed to socially community artwork, whether it be visual, literary, media, you know, media performing arts. Um, and Surviving the first wave of gentrification was also critical for us to double down and shift some of our work to include advocacy and policy in our organization. Um, it was important for us to hold elected officials and the Latinx leadership um, accountable and to acknowledge the role 
that art and culture plays in advocating for the empowerment of our communities and how it articulates uh, our core values. The last um, few years, as we've navigated this new sort of work around advocacy and policy, um, you know, we've we focus on two sections: is really developing a local and national lens on policy and advocacy, um, and to be at the table not only as art and culture for the sake of art and culture, while we believe it's really important, but also making sure that there was space in the conversations around community wealth building and that art was at the center of it. So rather than thinking of a 10-year plan, how funders fund, we're now putting our community development hats on and saying it has to be a 30 to 40 year plan to begin with by sustaining to sustain our organizations and building everlasting community wealth models. Um, we are also working collaboratively with like-minded organizations, organizations that have represented um, the mission social fabric that collectively um, have over 250 years of service in community. So we founded the Sustaining Mission Arts uh, and Culture Community, comprised of about six arts organizations that are earmarked that have done advocacy to secure the ground for floors of affordable housing projects. Um, this includes my colleagues from Dance Mission, um, Homie, uh, Youth Speaks, Poder, First Exposures, and Galeria. And so collectively, we're looking at models to help sustain our organizations beyond just the brick and mortar, but really sh shifting the cultural ethos of our community. Um, and so that's a little bit about what we're doing now in terms of planning and making sure that we uh, pivot, that we, um, as our uh, elder said yesterday, Dr. Amalia Mesa Baines, art is a vehicle and community is the goal. And so if we're gonna think of long lasting, you know, sustainability, the infrastructure, we have to think beyond a 10 year plan. So we're, we're in the process of that to secure a geographic region that will continue to support the historical legacies that have been there for now over 50 to 70 years. Annie, thank you so much. Because we're such a large panel, I don't wanna get into questions just yet, although I have a lot, um, but let's move on. And this way we'll have a section where we're all able to have an exchange and really rich conversation. David, I'm gonna come back to you with the hope that we'll be able to hear you a little better. Um, let's try this again. Hi, David. Okay. Okay, now. Can you hear me? No, no, you're freezing up. David, try getting off video. We hate losing the visual, but maybe without video, we can hear you better. No, we're having trouble hearing you. Okay, I think we'll move on to the next presenter. Um, Amy, it's, uh, it's, it's you and Alejandra now, no? Absolutely. You know, following up on what Ani just talked about, which, you know, art, uh, art is the vehicle, community is the goal. It reminds me of the fact that, you know, our organization, specifically uh, small to mid-sized organizations focused on marginalized community, marginalized communities, we have a double mandate, right? Where we serve uh, the, as a community resource and also as arts and culture practitioners. Alejandra, how are you defining uh, your, the, your work now in this moment uh, and how has it evolved through the rising pressures of COVID-19, Black Lives Matter and the upcoming election? Hi, me um, and hello everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I'm coming to you from my studio apartment in Regal Park, Queens, New York. So at some point, potentially, you might see my husband in the background. Um, you are in my kitchen. Welcome. It's as if we're having a meal together. Um, uh, this question really uh, is dear to my heart because uh, I am a white Latina. And so I live um, in the world of in-between spaces, right? I live in the world of someone that both experiences privilege, 
but also experiences xenophobia and and that those things have been an, an intricate part of who I am, how I've navigated the world, the story of my family, and uh, the things that have fueled my work as an artist and as an administrator and as an activist. Um, when I think about how I'm defining my work in this moment, one of the things that surfaces to the top for me is uh, Dance NYC and the work that we do as an organization, we're a service organization. Um, we serve the, the dance community in New York City specifically. Um, and while we were established as a program of Dance USA nearly 20 years ago, we have a long history of existing and actually one of my co-panelists was once the director of Dance NYC uh, several moons ago. Um, we, uh, we emerged out of the funding and service community identifying that we were needed. Um, we didn't necessarily actually as an organization emerge from individual dancers or dance organizations that said that we were needed. And so when I actually came to my work at Dance NYC, I came as a freelance arts worker. I was a theater practitioner, a stage manager, a movement practitioner, a community organizer. And I came into an administrative capacity at the organization as a part-time temporary employee. And, and I came with this experience of what immigrating to the United States meant for me and my family, what learning a new language meant, what um, working in New York City meant, what piecing together a million jobs meant. And moving then into an organization that at the time when I came here was in its own moment of transformation as it was addressing um, oppression within the disability community and which had to a certain extent dabbled on addressing uh, eth ethnic and racial uh, oppression but not um, as forwardly, right? It was very much in the wave of when DEI became like a thing in arts and culture and you know the, the support started coming in. When I came in as a, as a worker, that was my perspective. It was the perspective of, I know what, it, what it's like to be desperately trying to make work as an artist and not having enough to pay for health insurance having to choose between the artistic work that I was going to do and whether I could afford my rent, um, having to decide whether I could see my parents on any given year because there was no way I could afford going home because my family experienced family separation um, before it became a buzzword. And so it, it, those things informed how I started to function here. And eventually when I came into executive leadership, it, it shaped, it has shaped all of the different things that we've done and, and how we've shifted our identity as an organization as well. From thinking about uh, nourishing this idea of well-resourced dance to thinking about what does it mean for the dance worker, for the dance individual, for the dance group to thrive? What does it mean for them to be the owners of the material benefits of their work? What does it mean for arts workers and, and, and for the organizations that emerge in dance to build structures that actually allow for the thriving of individuals, right? And so the way that I, that, that I have defined my work is that as an organization and as I, as an individual have healed as a person, my organization has also healed because I have had to do the work of addressing harm that as an organization we did cause to our community and also in restructuring what we intend to do for the future. And so that work was work that couldn't happen as a hat that I would put in when I walked into the office. I as a bridge person and, and, and the strategy that I have taken is that is of being a bridge person. As, a, as, a, as someone that both um, holds benefit and someone that experiences oppression. I positioned us as a bridge organization where we became clear and aware of the systemic power that we held and how we could use that power to circumvent the very system that we are a part of and to return the material benefit to the people 
who this has always belonged to and that we simply needed to be essentially a megaphone. We weren't the holders of the substance. We're simply the mechanism that further highlights the work that artists, the dance workers, the dance organizations are already doing and have already been doing. And that the keys and the doors that we have access to, not only am I swinging them open, but I'm like propping them open and taking off the hinges and like taking off the frame and then bursting the wall open so that me and, and everyone that comes with me, which is the community that gave birth to me and our sister communities can roll right through, right? So that those those doors no longer have these like 16 combination locks and keys that only a specific person from a specific creed with a specific way of talking can get through it and access those resources. So in this time, the strategy has been, you know, I've been telling folks our our mission is pretty broad, right? Um, the the performance, the practice, the appreciation um, of dance in the New York City metropolitan area, right? To promote that. And we do that with these values of justice, equity, and inclusion, but that's super broad. What does that mean? I've been telling people what it is, is we are doing our job. If the gap between what dance workers and dance organizations need to thrive is reduced, that's our job. My job is to make that bridge smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And as uh, an organizer working now as an executive, my goal has been to plan for our irrelevance. If I do my job as an organization correctly, then I really should not be needed 50 years from now, 100 years from now. If our vision for a thriving, healthy, dance ecosystem comes to pass, then we don't need to be the megaphone because communities would be heard and communities will have connection to what they need to thrive. And the resources that have always been for theirs that were previously extracted simply return to them. That the resources that now within the philanthropic sector is like is the gatekeeper that that gatekeeper disappears because those resources are given back to their original stewards. So that has definitely been the, the strategy that I have very explicitly taken on. In light of COVID, in light of the largest civil rights movement that we're experiencing in the history of this country, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement that builds on the very first civil rights movement, um, stewarded by by the many many ancestors that set set the way for us now really what that has meant for us is our work has quadrupled <laughs> and my um my resolve around ensuring that the the very first beneficiaries of the work that we do are our staff members has increased why because what what business do we have serving the dance field if the very first members of the dance field that we serve, our staff members, aren't benefiting, if they aren't experiencing that thriving, if they aren't experiencing that resource, if they aren't experiencing the quality of life that we intend the sector to have. And so I've taken a very, you know, it's like, it's almost as if I could hear my mother here on my shoulder telling me, you know, like, Fix your house before you go fix anybody else's house. And so mm -hmm. during uh, the pandemic, the focus has been all the formalities have gone to waste. We got to we gotta shorten that distance between workers and, and what they need and looking inwards. How can we ensure that we as an organization and as an entity are actually living internally in our day-to-day, -day, the very things that we are telling the community that we're advocating on their behalf for and that we're telling others that they should be doing. So that that has been the strategy that we've taken. I gotta tell you, I haven't, there are some things that I've figured out and there are some things that I have not figured out. And some of those things are tied to our very own relationship within capitalism, our very, the 501c3 structure. I mean, 
the nonprofit structure in and of itself is a child of the philanthropic structure, which is a child of the extraction of wealth from slavery. And so, you know, we're, we're also within a structure that doesn't necessarily lend itself for the, the vision and the, and the ideas of liberation that we've learned and that have been passed down to us. And so That's there are things that I've figured out and there are things that if y'all have some ideas for me, I am happy to take, um, but I, I would say the, the most important thing has been that for us as a team, um, moving away from this idea of centering me as the primary expert of the work that we do and as the synonym of the organization and, and shifting into a model where we work and we function as a collective and where our team is you know, you can really reach out to any of our staff members because they are holders of the vision as well and they are executors of it as well. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's how I am navigating this moment. Thank you so much, Alejandra. That was amazing <laughs> and, and it truly inspired me. Uh, and I love what you were talking about in terms of, you know, what ways can we re-envision structure of our organizations? And I wanna, uh, talk to YK about that. YK, you've been a consultant to a myriad of organizations. Uh, in what ways can we re-envision? In what ways can we, you know, can we take our organizations beyond the traditional models uh, to address uh, the needs of our communities for the long term? Practical solutions, but sustainable so solutions that afford us the capacity to thrive beyond the moment. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, thank you so much. I am also really grateful to be here and want to echo what Alejandro was saying about if I do my job well, if we as anti-oppression and DEI practitioners do our jobs well, we won't be needed anymore. And I say that all the time because right now we're in this really awkward stage where systems and organizations have been built up already with not everyone included. And part of the issue now that we're in, we're in a collective teenage stage, is including everyone as an afterthought. So, hey, we built this great organization. Whoops, we forgot to include people of color. Let's include them now. Hey, we built this great organization. Whoops, we forgot to include women. Let's include them now. So we're in this really awkward stage as a collective. And one of the issues with that is that means everything is an afterthought. And that's one of the weaknesses of a lot of organizations. Fortunately, there are a lot of organizations that are doing a great job building from the ground up. Those are some of the strongest organizations we have and some of the ones that are modeling best practices of what organizational structures can look moving forward. One of the points that I constantly and consistently go back to is what movement organizers and community organizers have been doing around organizational structures since the beginning of time. For example, the Movement for Black Lives is led by Black folks, the most impacted folks, and that is critical in sustainability. That is critical in people who are the most impacted understanding the actual message. And back to what Alejandra was saying, the whole kind of cascading way that nonprofits have begun, that foundations have begun and how they're built is oftentimes reactive. But what organizing does is organizing is oftentimes proactive. And another thing that's often reactive is grant making and development work is sometimes reactive. So oftentimes grants are made or funding happens in reaction to certain events, certain kinds of issues that are happening. And we'll, we're seeing that a lot with not only COVID, but also with the uprisings that are happening due to long existing program problems. So one of the strengths I think that different structured organizations can have is to be proactive and to structure from the ground up already without even needing to be inclusive in the end. Um, another model I look toward a lot is disability justice organizing because it is really centering the fact that if you can liberate the most who are those who are most oppressed, if those who are most oppressed can be liberated, then all of us are liberated. 
some of the most fundamental principles there have to do with what we've seen during COVID, which is this idea of mutual aid. So mutual aid has existed for a very, very long time. It's a way of us taking care of ourselves. So not depending on large corporate structures, not depending on large federal structures, but creating systems for ourselves. And I'm seeing more and more as I'm working with organizations that they are creating systems and mechanisms that are becoming self-sustainable and internal as opposed to depending on external large systems. That could mean having a task force, having a rapid response team, having internal political education. So sustainability is a lot about internal and again, making my job obsolete. And that means making sure you have different models that are in your organization so that you're not relying on others, but also that you're building cross organizationally. So I think at the grassroots level, there's been a really great job done about sustainability. And as artists, as creators, as cultural workers, we're really, really good at it. But then we get into this area where we flow up into grant making and a lot of the times into federal funding even, and we become less sustainable. So we have the right ideas, we just have to build them up. I have another question for you actually, because we know that data is important, right? So when we're thinking about data and, and dismantling the systems that keep us in need, how do we plan strategically to gather information on our own terms that works to our benefit? Like what is the data that we need? So I love this question because we as artists are storytellers and we already know the kind of data we need. Unfortunately, when it comes to reporting, we have to translate that data into oftentimes quantitative data. <clears throat> Sometimes I work in uh, machine learning and bias. So with artificial intelligence and how algorithms are biased and racist, for example, because our data isn't subjective. So when you think about it, data actually tells a story and stories have narrators and narrators are biased. That means that the data that we're feeding into algorithms, the data that we're feeding into statistics is also biased. And that's why we often, for example, even have search results on search engines that is anti-black. And that means that the data itself that's being fed in is of course racist and anti-black. So we have to think about the whole story and the fact that data is never actually subjective, but that it is storytelling. And I think we have to go back to our roots of cultural workers, of storytellers, whether it's visual, performative, or whether we're telling stories in different ways, of going back to telling a more robust story and thinking of different ways of talking about data that's not just numeric. Thank you so much, YK. Melody, I'd like to pass it to you. Thank you. I've got to say, y'all showed up today. <laughs> you all showed up today. I'm loving this. I really am. Thank you. Um, Kimmy, yes. Kimmy Mojica, you'll be joining us next. Um, we're moving into the section that talks about opportunity and in what ways are we thriving or in need? The question, Kimmy, becomes, well, we had a, 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 a great, what was supposed to be like a 10 minute conversation a week ago, turned into about an hour and a half. We talked about the question of what does investment in small and mid-sized organizations look like? How do we move beyond the transactional to the transformational relationships we have with funders? Why do we have less organizations and, and funding now than we have now that we are the uh, numerical majority? And what has been the criteria of the work of the organization you work with, the Justice Funders, as we speak to dismantling philanthropy? Yeah. Yeah. I know there's a lot there, but I mean, these are the things we picked up on when we spoke, and you know, you can start at any. Well, anywhere. I want to really so one just thank folks for um, having me in this space. It's really wonderful to be here. So thank you again to all the organizers. And um, yeah, so justice funders, we're like, what is that? Do you have superhero capes or something? <laughs> but essentially we build the capacity of folks inside the system to be doing the organizing internally, um, really developing funder organizers in the space and strategy. Because we also believe to dismantle philanthropy, you need both an inside and outside game. So let's figure out who are the people inside 
that can be in partnership with folks on the ground, with organizations who are trying to push and change on the outside. So that's kind of the stance that I'm coming from. And when you were thinking about how to dismantle philanthropy, I think it's really important for everyone on either side of that relationship to really understand the history of this um, uh, institution. Um, as Alejandra and YK have mentioned, you know, uh, philanthropy and the nonprofit industrial complex have been one in the same, have been married to each other from the beginning. So I'm just gonna drop a little bit of history, partly just to frame the fact that this system is actually baby born. It's only a hundred years old. So back in 1913, the Revenue Act of 1913 was established to really um, tax the highest incomes in the country because there was a lowering of tariffs. But what that essentially had done was really um, uh, set up the beginnings of the nonprofit industrial complex. Because what happened was folks with wealth, and I'll just name this the Rockefellers and the Carnegie Corporations, they were the first two foundations ever established. They were doing their organizing in 1910 to 1912 before this got passed in 1913 um, to really figure out how to preserve and protect their wealth from being taxed. So when the Revenue Act came along to tax those high incomes, essentially those with wealth organized with business, banks, um, and academia to really try and find means to preserve wealth and the legal system and government. And so in many ways, the nonprofit sector was defined by their legal status of being 501c3s, um, so they didn't have to pay legal taxes. Um, but foundations, people with wealth, established their uh, charitable public charities and foundations, um, primarily with this tax incentive. Um, and that tax incentive really was so that they could keep accumulating their wealth and protecting their wealth. And like folks have said before, this is the wealth that was actually accumulated and extracted on the, on the backs of blood and sweat of Black folks, Indigenous folks, um, who are on this land way before. So public charities and foundations has actually existed for decades, but it wasn't until this particular moment that folks were um, incentivized to create foundations so they could not have their wealth taxed. And I'll just name that when Carnegie actually approached Congress with this, the current attorney general, George W. Wilkinson, actually stated at the time that this was an indefinite scheme for perpetuating vast wealth. And that was entirely inconsistent with public interests. So that is actually on the IRS books. It's in the court documents. Just to name that this field was created out of inequity and it was created in a way for wealth protection. So just to note that, and, and I just want to name that oftentimes um, when organizations come in or are trying to establish relationships with funders, and also when folks from nonprofit side or the art side go into philanthropy, because oftentimes philanthropy extracts people who are former executive directors to now be program officers and foundations. And while this is um, a worthy cause to have folks from the spaces themselves become um, folks inside the system, they're oftentimes not supported. And so just wanting to name that um, in many ways, when you get into that other side of the world of the philanthropic side and you think as a community-based activist or person that, oh, you're gonna do good, you're gonna be able to give money to the right places, the whole system is actually set up to preserve the wealth and do the exact same difference. So I just wanna name that the wealth that actually goes out um, in the philanthropic sector is at minimum only 5% of, of these foundations endowments. So there is tremendous amount of wealth harbored up tax-free inside these philanthropic institutions. And so they, at minimum, they only have to spend 5%, which is a drop in the bucket. So I'm just naming that because as uh, organizations are trying to do something different, oftentimes they get said, oh, that's the, that's the way it's always been done. And that's absolutely just not true. Folks have been doing mutual aid and passing around money and taking care of each other for a really, really long time without the tax write-off. And so just to name that this is actually a vehicle for wealth protection and of the elite to protect their assets and power that they actually stole from people. So 
I just, I just want to name that piece um, because I think as we start imagining what's new, um, thinking about how do we liberate the endowments? How do we demand that foundations actually dip in to their endowments so that they're not just collecting and giving away the interests, but they're actually um, going in on that large amounts of wealth, particularly under COVID, particularly under crisis. Um, we saw back in 2017, uh, philanthropy really retract um, when the housing crisis went down and the market went down. And here we are really um, trying to amplify voices and practices of folks that are really not trying to retract, but utilize this particular moment for huge amounts of opportunity and openings. So let's liberate the endowments. What would it be like to actually uh, go in as an acting as um, for a collective ask? What would it mean for all the organizations in a particular region or in a particular sector to approach foundations and say, no, you cannot fund us one by one. We want you to fund all of us for this amount of time in these phases. And you know what, funder, go get another funder and funder organize your peers. So that is something else that we are trying to support as well. So I just wanna just name that it took 100 years to put this in place. Uh, we at Justice Funders, our long-term vision is to see philanthropy non-existent because we liber liberated the endowments and we put community back in control of the resources that were taken from them. So I'll pause there, um, but I'm looking forward to more conversation with folks. Kimmy, thank you so much. At the point where we talk about reimagining for so many of us, uh, the all of our organizations, in a moment where we're all reimagining ourselves, reimagining ourselves in this time where we don't know how we're going to come out at the at the other end, it really is about the philanthropic community also reimagining how they do what they do, and if they're going to come to the table as true partners, that they that that they bring that they work with us, listen to us, and help us to help them reimagine what that looks thank like you. for us all. So thank you. Amy? Amy, we don't hear you. I said, all I heard just now was reparations, reparations, Great reparations. So I said that when we opened. I <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, building on the histories of our practice and our institutions, our community, I mean, I wanted to ask you a question about something you said recently when we were on a group call. You said that we're facing a time of counterinsurgency. I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate on that, uh, what it means to be, what it means in terms of being in community um, and your ideas around people power. Yeah, no, thanks for having me and thanks for organizing. And I'm really um, excited to kind of hear everyone's um, thoughts. I think that, you know, back to what, you know, Melody said at the opening and what you have said in the conversations we have had, ultimately art and culture for oppressed people aren't separate. And if you tie in the, uh, you know, not-for-profit industrial complex, its role is counterinsurgency through soft power by dividing people up, having you use your time to apply for money even though you're owed much more, right? And it plays us off each other. In a resource that they say is um, finite, and in fact, there's plenty of abundance, right? Um, so I think like it's it would be, if you take seriously reparations and you take seriously that we're actually in to get free and we're either all of us are free or none of us are free, then you have to think me as an artist and as an organizer and an educator, what is my relationship to institutions and how do I fight back and build other institutions? And by that, they can't look the same, but they also can't be hierarchical. Right. There's ways by which we have an abundance in our own community. Now, the issue becomes power doesn't want us to do that. And so now I'm going to anchor these just slight observations in the reason I brought up counterinsurgency. You know, as Decolonize This Place, which is many groups, and shout outs to everyone that's doing the work 
And I think that when I say and I share these thoughts, they're not mine, they're collective making and they're ancestral and they come from a lot of different contexts and histories of struggle. When we organized against the Whitney to remove Warren Canders, here's a person that makes money off of making tear gas, right? At a time in which the biennial had for the first time in its history, after the debacle with Dana, Dana Schutz, had black, brown, queer, indigenous artists under 40, right, celebrated. But at the same time, the representation that they were selecting concealed what was happening at the museum, which is they have Warren Canders who makes money off of tear gas that shot in Ferguson, that shot in Palestine, in Baltimore, right, on the border. He makes money off of bullets that kill people. He makes money off of shit that he sells to the NYPD, right? So what does it mean for an artist who's seeking representation, who wants to reach the height of an art world, be inducted into the Whitney Biennial, the settler colonial that just actually makes art that gives value by putting it on white walls curated by white people that then gets sold, that harbors people's money as tax havens? Right, That's the contradictions that we're living in. But this Whitney Biennial then has Warren Canders, right? because he brings in money for the museum. And then we're told by the Whitney, it's better to have the Whitney than not have the Whitney. right? And in the midst of all that, the organizing that we did later on, two months ago, I found out that I'm being investigated by the FBI in May 2019 which was one of the last actions we did against the Whitney before the biennial opened. This is probably the first time I share this in public, but I do it because it's important to recognize that if we take seriously what we're saying, right, then we're unsettling power. The Ford Foundation got $2 billion now to give out for mutual aid, to give out for abolition work. Who are they giving it to? 501c3s? Maybe. Why? That's the question. We have to ask ourselves why. Because at the end of the day, they're trying to put us down, and we have an opportunity right now to fight back and build other things. Example would be what happened in France maybe three or four months ago. A black person. <clears throat> Uh, somewhere from Africa, had ancestral objects in one of the museums. They didn't demand return. They went and took that shit because it's theirs. If you take seriously reparations, if you take seriously restitution, if you take seriously that these objects, which are not objects, right, they call them objects. But if those things need to be returned to, to belong to the people that it has come from, which probably people would have never called them art. Western modernity calls it art because it wants to give a value to it, because it wants to sell it, because it wants to treat it as a transaction. So if you want to take that seriously, what would happen to museums over here? They're colonial structures to begin with. There is no redemption of it, but at the same time, they's like, well, what do you want to do? Abolish the museum? And all you got to do is like, I don't know. I just know this shit needs to go back to where it came from. Then they tell you, but, but do you see what it means? Because two, two institutions are critical for settler colonialism. And I think the United States as a settler colonial project is not an event that has ended. They took the land, genocided the people. Those who lived are rendered invisible. Now they suffer from COVID. Then you have enslaved people here to do the labor for free, to build this country. The ramifications of that continue to this day with the NYPD. They continue to this day with the names of the people that were mentioned all over this country. So if we're going to take what we're talking about seriously, how did this become how did this knowledge get lost? We're against settler colonialism. We're not against police shooting black folks. We're not against a museum existing, 
But all its shit that's stolen needs to be returned. It's been looted. It needs to live. It needs to breathe. What that means is that you're taking shit back. People have demanded for the longest time. The question is, what do we demand from each other? Reparations just doesn't come through the state. In our acts and every day, we need to recognize the debts we owe each other. I'm Palestinian. I'm here as a settler in New York City. I am not black. I do not have those experiences. I have others. So black folks need to be against anti-imperialism and against settler colonization. Indigenous people need to be for black liberation, right? And anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist. And the, these things, our experience is that they can't be, we can't bifurcate because the existence of ourselves right now is that they want us to choose one issue. So now you have the Brooklyn Museum, hey, black lives. Everyone, hey, black lives. But who are you saying black lives to? To who? Black lives matter to whom? Who are you saying? To feel better? So I think like one of the things that decolonize this place has put forward is this idea, if we're serious about reparations, restitution, these kind of things that undo the structure of oppression by working from where we are in relation to communities and structures that we have a direct relationship to, for example, as artists or as creative pe people, then we need to take action. Action in the most expansive sense. There's not one way to act, there's many, right? But one of the things that has to be certain is that they need, we need to be transgressive. Some of our work needs to be transgressive. Maybe not the 501c3, but we can hit institutions, hit their brand, so that they can actually feel uncomfortable, that they can open up internally and externally the inside outside game to then begin a process of things returning. Power has never given just by asking. And, and we should not treat cultural institutions any different because museums, and you know, we're talking about small and medium, but who takes the cream of the pie? Who's, who, how much is the AMNH getting? How much is the Met getting? Who goes to their galas, right? And then they throw it as crumbs. But to ask for more isn't a strategy that we've seen work. So then the question is, and I think this, this conversation is already doing, how can we reorient to each other and recognize that this moment requires struggle and struggle requires uncomfortability? If you're comfortable with, what, I say this to myself all the time, if something I am doing is comfortable, I am not doing enough. I teach at NYU. There's no purity in this. I teach at NYU. I know that the students I teach, I put them in debt. I know that when you have debt, you are not free. I know that freedom is about time. And that's why they have us work 17 hours a day. Because freedom is not this abstract thing. Freedom for you and for me look differently. The university shackles people. It teaches them, it educates them if they're lucky about freedom, about black liberation, about the history of this country. But they pay so much to go to good education that they'll live to be 60 and they probably wouldn't pay their student loans off. Which means we have to ask ourselves, how are we moving? These universities are actually part of the colonial structure. They perpetuate whiteness. They perpetuate a failure of imagination. They keep telling us this is the best that we can do. You're not smart enough. It can't be any different. Museums are the same way. They tell us, oh, you should be happy. Now you can tell your story. Fuck it. I don't want to tell my story to you. I don't want you to consume it. I want us to be free. I want these borders to not count. I want to be able to live and thrive. And that's what Fred Moten, just like maybe a month ago, we were having a conversation. And he's just like, you know what? I look at all this stuff. I love art and I hate museums and I can't stand institutions because they mediate the relationships that should be open amongst us. 
They can modify everything. Why should they be between us? Right? And he's like, the only thing I can imagine worth doing right now is, is figuring out how to live and advancing the task of living. So it's not art, culture, politics, voting, all these things. This is the basics. And, 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 and artists, creative people, have their precarity is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's hard to live. On the other hand, they have a different relationship to time and space, and they can facilitate actually the overthrowing of this structure. You can't go after a museum and think you're not out going after the state. It's just not, not, not real. Because who's on their boards? Wealthy people, where did they get their wealth from? Again, look at Warren Candors, look at BlackRock, look at all these places, at MoMA, at the Met. Those people are taking what you should be going to our communities, these organizations. They force you in a 501c3, they say do it that way, and they tell you here's what money can go for. And in short, I'll just say like, we are serious about reparations. I think one of the things that we've advanced through our actions is that ability to organize and go to institutions and actually enact what we want to see. And other people are doing the same thing. And I think that what ends up happening in these kind of situations, in the context of the Whitney, internally the staff organized, right? They organized just by doing a letter. But that letter was so critical because then it opened up a conversation that somebody from the outside can say, how can we be in solidarity with people that have put their jobs on the line to say, this is a line around funding that we cannot accept. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And it goes back to what you were saying the other day about an awakening on class that needs to be central to the conversation. So thank you so much, Amin, uh, for your comments, very enlightening. Um, I wanna pass it back to uh, Melody and Michelle. Thank you, Amy. Hello, hello. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> um, based on our prep talk for this conversation, we were talking about some of the models that we have um, looked at and what, what everyone is bringing today are different concepts, different ideas, different ways of doing what we do um, and, and, and being able to negotiate a space that says we'll do it this way or that way. We're ima re imagining and reimagining different ways of being able to thrive and sustain and build and become stable. We can walk away with the, from here with several plans, several paths to take because everyone has lent a different lens, a different voice to how we can get this done. When we talk about collaboration and building of networks, where we support each other's growth and sustainability locally, regionally, nationally, and across the, across the globe, can you speak to some of the work you have been doing in the South in support of your community yes, through collaboration? Yes, I would be happy to. And, and again, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and uh, thrilled to be sharing space with all of you. Uh, Michelle Ramos, my pronouns are she, her, her. I am calling in from New Orleans, Louisiana, better known as Bull Bancha, native indigenous land. Uh, thrilled to be here with you all and um, excited to sort of lift up uh, some stories of things that we are doing down here to um, look at alternative ways uh, to get around uh, what so many have lovingly called on this uh, call the nonprofit nonprofit industrial complex. Um, so I work for Alternate Roots, uh, which is a 44-year-old organization that is supports artists that do uh, work uh, grounded in social justice. So at the intersection of art and social justice, and the organization was founded for that region because reason because there were so many arts and artist organizations who were doing this work, but really no, you know, um, service organization or place that, you know, represented them and their work. And so we were founded 44 years ago and we represent artists across 14 states in the South. Um, so as um, one of the only, I think the only uh, Southern panelist uh, on today's call, I wanted to offer some context about the South that I think is really important to what I'm about to share. Um, so I think it's important to know that 
uh, the national foundations, 44% less investment in the South uh, than the rest of the United States. And if we turn to the arts, what we find is that less than 4% of all national arts funding comes to this region. So I offer that as a lens to say, this is what we live with. This is this is our reality and has been our, our reality for a very long time. The disinvestment in the South is very real. And then if you turn to what's going on now with COVID um, and with the uprisings, you know, we know our regions are the most impacted, five out of the, the top 10 um, highest um, COVID outbreak regions are from one of from my 14 states. Um, and so, you know, the impact is here. And so uh, the thing that I'm excited to talk to you all about today is that our, um, our, our, our fellow community organizers and movement leaders and, and folks in this region um, simply just are not going to be OK with the status quo. Right. Um, as an arts organization, you know, earlier this year, there was this huge big, huge announcement about all this amazing funding that was going to go out to artists. And it was just going to be this national pool of funds. And, you know, myself with a couple of other of our colleagues who are cultural specific organizations or, or uh, run by the IPOC folks were like, well, none of that money is coming to us. <laughs> like, we know that's not happening. We know that none of that money is going to reach us. And so, um, you know, we collectively as five organizations went to approach the national funders to say, look, we know historically this money isn't going to get to us. We know that you know when it when it comes to to the arts nonprofit industrial complex, a lot of our artists are community organizers and cultural bearers and folks who who you know don't identify as a quote unquote professional artist. Like they're not going to get that money. So you need to give us the money. You need to give money to our communities. Um, and I have to tell you, it was it was a huge battle. And that battle, I. I co-battled with my colleagues from NALAC, the National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures, the Pai Foundation out of uh, Hawaii, uh, First Peoples Fund, and SIP Culture out of Mississippi. And the five of us were able to, able to pool together as partners. And, and to be clear, that partnership is a 10-year long partnership. Um, but we were able to, to pool together as partners to go after a national funder to say no, no this can't be the status quo. This can't be the way that it's always been. Um, and so the power in that partnership was what resulted in the success. So that's an example um, of the collaboration and partnership working within the institution, which in and of itself is still problematic, right? Because you're still playing under in that same sandbox of white supremacist practices and structures and reporting and all the things, right? Um, but one other um, partnership that Roots is involved in that I'm super excited to share out with all of y'all today is what is called the Southern Power Fund. Um, and this is a collective of about 20 movement leaders, social justice organizations across the South who came together um, shortly after the uprisings and, and the COVID outbreaks and, outbreaks and said, you know what? We know how this goes. <laughs> we know that you know if there's national funding that you know less than you know four percent of it's going to come down to our region. We know that we're not going to see that money, and we know based on the reporting that our regions are going to be the most impacted. So we need to take this into our own hands, and we need to qu quit hoping for hope, like we always do, that something's going to change because we know it's not going to change. And so that partnership started a regional tapestry of movement leaders, uh, movement builders, community organizers who came together and said, we got to we got to find another way to make this work. Uh, and we need to be able to get resources to Southern frontline um, community, you know, responders, first responders, um, COVID uprising responders. We need to get money into those people's hands on the front lines. Um, and we know there's a historical disinvestment um, by nonprofit philanthropy in our regions. So we need to make this happen ourselves. Um, so we set out to create a goal of raising $10 million. We were like, that's it. We need to raise this money. We need to make it happen and we need to get it out. It needed to be an immediate response, get the money out the door 
get it into the hands of the organizations that are leading all the transformational work on the ground. And that money could um, come by way of like mutual aid, direct support. Um, it could come by way of like hot zone campaigns of, of different hot zones that are happening in different regions, um, ecosystem and infrastructure building, as well as just building um, a community controlled fund, which was part of the, the original $10 million planning. So the plan was, $8 million out the door in two waves of money and $10 million to stay as a community controlled fund that would be seed a community controlled fund that we would want to grow into the future. And so, um, and so that, that became the plan and that turned into weekly two hour calls of everybody coming together and setting up uh, funder webinars to try to get uh, philanthropic allies. And let me be really clear when I say philanthropic allies, because that's a very intentional use of that word, right? This is allies who we knew understood the historical disenfranchisement of our region and who wanted to right a past wrong, not just anybody that wanted to come play in the sandbox. And so much so that there were funders who came because as the word started spreading and people started hearing all of this, they're like, oh, well, we want to get on that. That sounds, yeah, that's that sounds great. And we had to say no to some funders because look, if you're going to make us a jump through all the red hoops and do all the things that you know we have had to do historically, we are not interested in that. This is a new way of being and a new way of doing. And so we launched the first round of funding um, about about two weeks ago. Um, and the way that it works are four pillar organization: Alternate Roots, Highlander Center. Project South and uh, Southerners on New Ground. And so we act as the funnel. And so we get the money out to the organizations and literally the organizations are nominated. No application process, no RFP, no submit this, no do that. Because we know the people on the ground know who needs the money and where that money is gonna have the most impact. So organizations were nominated and y'all, people like got an email and a phone call and they're like, hey, we appreciate the work you're doing. We see you. We know you're doing the work that matters. Have $40,000. Boom. Like I felt like Oprah, you know, <laughs> like have $40,000, have $40,000. But it worked. It actually worked. And it took all of us coming together saying we're not playing by the same old rules. We need to fix this. And the thing that excites me about this is like, if we're, you know, if, we're doing this in the South. Imagine if we could grow this to be a, a way of working, you know, at the national level. You know, there's a saying that as the South goes, so goes the nation. But like for real, like this could totally be something that we could expand to the national level. And it kind of goes back to something YK said earlier uh, in the presentation, which is you have to trust the people closest to the injustice, closest to the inequity and closest to the work. If you trust the people closest to the work, you're going to get the outcome that you're looking for. And that's the number one problem with philanthropy and the nonprofit industrial complex, right? It's the gatekeeping. It's the, the thresholds. It's the applications. It's the wording. It's, the, it's all the things. Um, and so, you know, for us, we were like, no more. No more. We can't do this anymore. And so um, I just want to share that because I think it is hopeful we have done it. We got $4 million out the door the last two weeks. We're getting another $4 million out by the end of the year. And we're seeding this community controlled fund because we want this to be a model for how things can work and work at the, at, from the, the community up. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Michelle, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Again, another model that we just really have to, to, to consider as we begin to take the power into our own hands. David, I'm sorry that we left you for the end. I'm glad that you're back. Let's see if we can hear you because I'd like to, while we were gonna open with you, maybe it, may, it makes good sense to close this section of the panel with you to speak a little bit about the legacy and some of the different frameworks that, well, the different frameworks that we use um, as cultural, culturally, based, community-based organizations versus those of the mainstream, and speaking a little bit about the history of the cultural equity group that was formed almost 30 years ago um, to respond to, to con take control of what we feel we need as organizations in order to continue to do the work that we do and thrive. Let's hear you and see if we can hear you better now.
We're Can not. you hear me now? Can you hear? I'm unmuted. You're unmuted, I'm but unmuted. you're unmuted. Are you here? Go on. Let's see if we can hear you. You're freezing. Hello. Okay. As long as my voice. All right. You can hear my voice, okay? We hear you better. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, I'll just read. Uh, I'll send everybody the land acknowledgement that I nobody can hear. I guess I'll try to send it to you, Melody, so you can. It's all right. And then um, I'll read the statement that I have. At least since the Blue, uh, Bloomberg administration, Amarinda has experienced in a very acute way the inequitable distribution of funds and the same severe curtailment of rights as other organizations of color. The funders are supportive while continuing to support the larger, more elitist institutes. A major problem that we continue to experience is overburdensome and mandatory paperwork very much uh, as has just been mentioned, uh, such as the <clears throat> Data Arts Project, which places undue stress on small organizations with limited staff, such as ours, tends to alienate small organizations of color, the very clientele government representatives profess to support. Some of the regulations and redundancies required now are almost designed to force smaller organizations to fail. From our viewpoint, it seems as if white American society today is so used to corruption, both large and small scale in the public sector, that funders in the government seem all to expect even small organizations to be capable of large scale malfeasance. Unique to our mandate as a community-based Native American organization, even though our constituency consists of tribally enrolled individuals in many cases, members of sovereign native nations and carry a tremendous burden of history, we are rendered invisible, constantly fighting for basic recognition within society or against the stereotype distortions of our image. A con contributing factor to our under recognition politically is our relatively small numbers compared to other groups. Having been presented with the opportunity, we made substantive recommendations in our contribution to the city arts City's cultural arts plan, we were toward this recommendation practical, formalized, or constructive way in which the city might interface community. Among the recommendations we stated was the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which states that all Indigenous people have the right to perpetuate and sustain their traditions and legacies. This we will continue to do. Despite these hindrances, Amarinda does not always focus on diversify large institutes, even though we support such efforts, nor do we represent as these large non-native institutions. We seek to always empower native artists from the ground up, empower native organizations in the same way, and function with other institutions and organizations at the level of policy maker and planner, by which we can re co-create and design whatever the activity or project may be. Find Amarin believes, as Diane has stated, the founder has stated that a generational approach is needed to funding now in order to actualize the necessary sustainability required in order to achieve a more equitable footing in the face of tremendous opposition to the well-being of smaller community-based organizations of color. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, David. Amy? Thank you very much. Thank you. We're moving into... Yes, now we're moving into part three, which is all about crystallizing our demands. What can our future look like? This part is an intergroup, interactive group conversation where we'll each have, you know, we can converse over, you know, our general ideas and kind of comment on things that have been raised that we wanted to speak on earlier that we didn't get the chance to. Um, also, we'll be fielding questions from the audience simultaneously, because I know we only have a bit, we have about 30 minutes left of the conversation. Right. Um, I do, I do just to kick off the conversation, want to uh, uh, bring up one statement that Annie shared with us a couple of days ago, 
um, as you know, part of her community, part of our community plan that we're crystallizing in this moment, community wealth building through societal acquisitions, um, investing in a 100 year community plan. Thoughts? And this is open to everyone. Um, I can speak a little bit about more about that. I realized that the camera, my camera is out. You can hear me, so that's we cool. You. We oh, see we you. Uh, you. We do. Okay. Yeah. I have a green yeah. screen, but it's okay. <laughs> um, I feel that you know to to think about that. One is to reiterate your point, Melody. Is it feels like you want us to win, and we have models on a national level that have been doing this. So the one. Um, project that I can think of is the Village uh, of Arts and Humanities out of Philadelphia. They have a hundred year plan. They are looking for a hundred jobs, a hundred houses. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to think that, you know, in that range, one of the very beliefs that we practice in the work that we do is that we create for not only ourselves, but the seven generations that came before us and the seven generations that are gonna come ahead of us. And so that requires a long-term range plan. For our projects here in the San Francisco Mission District, we're looking at it, we've, we've identified the sites, we've gotta secure them. There is a plan that's larger part of an economic development for the district. However, the arts continues to be left behind. And what I think needs to be part of these plans is artists, we have to stop expecting from artists and put them at the center as connectors and investing in their sustainability to survive, to have a home, making sure that all the projects that we do include, you know, housing for artists, work for artists, healthcare as connectors and, you know, cultural place uh, makers and keepers. And so I think that for, for us, it really, that's what it looks like. It's a plan that, that centers artists, that allows us to be in all the areas of development and that we don't have to be worried about whether we're gonna be able to make payroll tomorrow because you know we're doing not only the historic legacy work, but we're also essential workers during this time of, of keeping our communities healthy and safe. That's what I would advocate for. Um, and to really push, I mean, I've been having this conversation, starting this conversation with Kimmy around pushing philanthropy. That's the other kind of approach, 5% of their endowment is only protecting their wealth and I'm tired of it. I mean, like we are doing so much work with pennies and that's just not sustainable. It hasn't been. So I think we also have to, um, that goes back to the advocacy and policy. There has to be some work investment in cultural organizations to be empowered, to be the advocates and not depend on representation at the state level, at the national level, at the local. ourselves to pay us to do this. We've been doing it unpaid for too many years. So that's what I would say. Anybody else? Kimmy, you want to add to that? I mean, I just want to echo what um, Annie and Michelle are, are naming around putting the power of the decision makers in the hands of the artists, the creators, the movement leaders themselves. There are experiments happening all over. Um, I just want to name that. Um, that that is in fashion of what Michelle is doing as well. Also, there are folks, philanthropic allies, who are trying to work the system inside. Our partners at um, uh, Thousand Currents, they just require a small video. And the only question folks have to ask or answer is, what does Thousand Currents need to know about your work now? That's the only thing. That's the only thing they require. All the due diligence, all of that reporting stuff is actually comes from the legal protection of wealth. They don't actually legally have to have any of that information. And so again, this piece around, oh, these organizations can only be as radical and expansive as imagination as the donors or the people with wealth. And so I'm just naming that people on the inside of the system, they need to take on greater risk to change it also from the inside in the ways that are needed and necessary. And let's be in conversation, just like Aman was talking about, around like, let's break down these walls, let's be in each other's living rooms and kitchens. But it's like, we don't really need um, all this um, bureaucracy and tape here. It really is um, really to keep the collective power 
you know, from really rising up together. So I just want to echo what a lot of folks are already saying. Yeah, Melody, you, you said that you wanted to advocate for transfer, transformative general support funding instead of restricted and program support. Can you speak up to that? Yeah, I think what we've seen during COVID, a lot of us were able to find um, restricted grants, programmatic grants were then released as unrestricted or general operating. That's what we need. Again, when we when we speak the programmatic funding, the restricted funding, it is intended to keep us small. When we talk about multi-year funding, even around capacity, whether it's about capacity, as I mentioned in my opening, whether there's a theme, a moment where we are the flavor of the month, the funding might be a commitment of two or three years, but once that funding is pulled, we're back at zero. There is nothing that builds us or positions us in a way that says we will, we're being positioned to be sustained. We're being positioned for growth. Uh, you know, if we have space, as Annie's been speaking to you too, and the center having a, a building on 125th Street, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a whole different ball game, right? And so when we talk about funding, we're talking about, I mean, um, I see David's not, not on the call. The uh, director of Amarinda said, Fund our organizations like all of these white institutions were funded for 99 years. Money has been put in these institutions to assure from the very beginning that they would be here 100 years later. Fund us the same way. Fund us so that we're able to not only be stabilized, but be able to thrive, to be able to be innovative, to be able to plan for the next phase of development and not thinking year to year funding and not wondering whether or not, even if we expand today, next year the funding gets cut and we have to cut by one or two or three staff persons. I don't think anybody on this on this call has a staff of more than 10 if you have that. So when we talk about transactional, we need to move to transformational, to conversations with funders that says there is going to be a paradigm shift. I think we've all spoken to the, the um, the bureaucracy, the paperwork, the time the time it takes to pull any of this together. And then once the money's come in and you've been able to meet the deadline, now there's a deadline for getting the program done and get a, re a final report in, right? And so what we're saying is let's create a model that really allows our organizations to work, collaborate, grow, expand, plan, plan, and plan. We can't plan with the your funding. So the, 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 the support we're looking for now would be to request general operating, unrestricted funding, little strings tied to them. We're, we're knowing more and more, I mean, the information we're learning today is an information we didn't know 30 years ago when CEG was, was formed. We knew that foundations were, were, were funding from their endowments. We're not even hitting them hard in the back. It's from their endowments and they're choosing to work with 5%. As, as Jimmy said earlier, liberate the endowments. Yeah. <laughs> right? Liberate the endowments. And make these certain, it's beyond also just the grant making, but there's certain funding opportunities that don't ever come down to the small, medium sized organizations. For example, an impact funding, would they have the ability to give a 0% loan that are sometimes forgivable? And half of the time, those. those those they're not accessible we have to like almost beg because the the project has to be fully cooked before they're even willing to talk to us that is that that they're keeping us from creating our wealth and that has to shift and it also has to be beyond philanthropy you know philanthropy it is other folks that hold somebody posted who's the gatekeepers and how are we also keeping them accountable to the work that we're doing so i think there's it's a very complex conversation, but I think this is a moment of transformation. And it's also and this asked. institution that de defined, or I'm sorry, Amy, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no worries. I was just going to say someone just, a question just uh, came up on screen where someone was asking, okay, these ideas are great, but how do we actually instigate them? How do we create the strategies to implement these in, in real time? Well, the purpose of this panel was to say that we would come up with certain demands and it, that's exactly what it requires coming up to have this conversation and walk away with, okay, guys, great ideas, you know, but it's about creating demands and being able to come together, not the eight of us on this call or the nine of us on this call, but really pulling together in well, partnership I with the with philanthropic partners. Again, as, as uh, 
Kimmy mentioned earlier, there are folks who are willing to have this conversation and are beginning to shift some of the thinking and have that thinking within um, the, the philanthropic community. Let's have the conversation. Let's be heard. Let's come up with a plan and a demand that says, you know, item one, liberate the endowments. You know, just come up with a list that says, this is what we're prepared. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. But anyone else can jump in? Sorry Go about ahead. that. I'm also here, but I'm also hearing from like Michelle and Amin, um, and a little bit of what YK was saying earlier about creating our own ecosystem. Are Other model simultaneously as a model. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like for us now? So here's the thing. I'll just add a little bit here. There, there's already a hundred year plan. It's been, it was made a hundred years ago, and it's made ten years before that, and ten years after that. The Movement for Black Lives has a really solid plan called the Breathe Act, which actually outlines grant making for communities and neighborhoods and organizing groups, and it's all laid out as a really clear strategy, and they're trying to push it to the federal level. Uh, there are tons of strategies out there. Foundations haven't listened to a lot of those strategies because foundations have been reactive, as I've said, and not proactive. But as everyone on this entire panel has said, artists and cultural workers have very, very solid foundations for being proactive. And there's already strategies and plans out there. So we don't need to reproduce them. There's already plans out there. We just need to push them up towards the foundations. Exactly. That's what I said. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you're smiling. I think you have to <laughs> something that came up. No, go ahead, Alejandra. <laughs> something that came up in the in the comments, and it it was affirming to read them in the comments because in preparing for the panel, I I was writing what my demand was, um, and I wrote here a world where workers and their families can experience the material benefits of their work, where they are able to access what they need to thrive, not solely based on capitalistic ideas of productivity, where artists are seen as necessary workers and necessary members of society. I keep thinking about how, um, part of the reason why so many of the institutions that many of us have either made out of necessity, out of addressing the need that, that you know, a gap in a community or the shifts that we've made in institutions that maybe we didn't start and now steward. Um, it keeps echoing to me, you know, the structure of making the building, like if we build it, people will come kind of thing. And, and I keep thinking about what happens if we shift where, what our entry point is. Like, what if, we first start by saying, what is the experience of the individual? What do they need to be to thrive, to be whole, for healthy, uh, just even like nuclear family or, or nuclear community, right? You think about the stakeholders in a community and those things vary from culture to culture. But if, if you look at the smallest iteration of community, what does that smallest iteration of community need to thrive? And that then what we build comes from there, as opposed to building an institution hoping that things trickle down, but on the opposite way, right? And, and so I think about what would it mean um, for me, like what kind of artistic work, what kind of world can I imagine, going back to what you were saying, I mean, right? Like what kind of world would I be able to create if I wasn't, worried about the many hours that I have to punch in the clock in order for me to pay the bill that somebody else has imposed on me to pay the rent to say the thing so I'm not this and then and then you know all of the trickle down impacts of you not buying into all of the structures that were imposed on us right and so I think about what would happen imagine what our artists could create if they weren't thinking about how am I going to pay my rent what am I going to eat? If I get sick, I can't go to the doctor. If I, uh, you know, don't vote, then all of a sudden there's going to be a, a murder on in office, right? Like what, what happens if the, the system was truly made about honoring the individual as opposed to protecting its wealth? Then we look at the building of our institutions again. When we speak to Annie and all that you're doing with with your space after being in a space for so long, um, 
the, the, the notion even of erasure, right? Of diminishing us, of excluding us, of gentrification, um, labeling us. I mean, now the new hot top, the hot, hot word is BIPOC, you know, being BIPOC or being Alana. Um, that's a way of erasing us. That's a way of just not including us. I am Latina. I am Afro Puerto Rican. I'm Afro Puerto Rican. Call it. I'm black. I'm cool with it. We're Chicano. Right? But, yeah, all of these terms also are ways that kind of are confusing and kind of do this and blur, blur lines. I mean, I still don't understand and couldn't, couldn't say to you the acronym what what Alana stands for, and I just understood the other day what BIPOC stood for. But you know, when you look at that and you look at our communities as our communities are shifting and moving and being pushed out, our neighborhoods are changing. Um, in El Barrio, they're talking in El Barrio, East Harlem, in New York City. The new community, the new the new folks moving in, the others because they are now the others are being referred to as the new residents, and so you have spaces and parks where drumming and and community coming together now has all of these restrictions and boundaries as to when you can drum and where you can drum and how long you can drum, in communities that typically this is how we gather, this is how we tell stories, this is how we come together. And yet here again, they're just ways of pu putting these boundaries that say to us, um, you know, again, keep us small and keep us local and maybe we'll disappear, right? Maybe we'll be pushed somewhere else. And so with the 15 or so minutes that we have left, um, Amy, I'm saying, are we talking about coming up with some demands? Are we, uh, there are some questions or statements yeah. that have come up on the screen that we've responded to. Is there anything anyone on the panel would want to recommend as a demand or suggestions for how we begin to see change with our philanthropic community and other communities, because there are several models that we've put out this evening. Yes, I mean. Yeah, I, I want to just kind of say a few things because I think it's possible and I think everyone's done the work and I just want to kind of clarify or emphasize um, something you clarified, which is, you know, we, we say about it in terms of diversity of strategies and tactics, that it's not a, t today isn't one about unity where we have exactly. to argue and agree on one thing. So how do we support each other within a political framework that ensures that each of our struggles is advanced? And I think that, so I'm gonna say a few things, a few principles, and then I'm gonna offer just like one thing that can bring these things together. <clears throat> you know, Grace Lee Boggs often asked us, what time is it on the clock of the world? And I think that one of the things, the time is one of fascism. And fascism is just colonialism coming home, which is what comes from the black radical tradition. So it, there's nothing different. The difference right now is like more people are being harmed, more harm is visible, it's accelerated. We're in a constant state of crisis. COVID, if it's not COVID, it's gonna be something else. You've seen news in the past week, you could consider it of 10 years. So, so there's a different relationship to time. What we need to do is not be reactionary to this moment and not to be naive with power. Right, because it is it is content on our destruction. For the longest time, we have demanded inclusive to be included. The time necessarily isn't about inclusion. This is just a broad framework, but the demands can be made. So, one of the things that Zabatista has taught us is how do we, you know how do we move together and separately, but in agreement. This means on a spectrum. You can have the gallery, you can have, you know, what's happening in the South, you can have alternative modes of funding. You can do direct action that creates a crisis at an institution that changes the national conversation that makes the funders actually gravitate to you because they want to, you know, paper it and, and make things better. This is what movements do. The thing about movements is that they need to keep moving and not be taken in and co-opted, which is what the Brooklyn Museum is doing, what the Whitney Museum is doing, what MoMA is doing. So just keeping that in mind. Now, if we agree with that, another point that we need to recognize is that artist isn't a class. And Grace Lee Boggs, uh, not Grace Lee Boggs, uh, Gayatri Spivak says, identity often obscures class. And I think within artists, artists are agents of gentrification. 
location in Harlem. Someone may look brown, may look black, like I'm in Palestine. My oppressor is Palestinian. So recognizing that just being black isn't sufficient to understand the nuance of what we're trying to do towards liberation. This also comes from the black radical tradition. What I mean is that when people were organizing against the Brooklyn Museum, because they had gentr they had developers being hosted at the Brooklyn Museum, artists and community organizers did a day of action. And you know what they did? They couldn't agree on the land. They fought because artists wanted free space, right? Communities not to, be, not to be thrown out of their neighborhoods. This is why just talking about artists is not good enough, right? So if we recognize these things, then we say, how have we just like handled it? With the Brooklyn Museum, with the American Museum of Natural History, with um, the Whitney, what we've often said is like, you need a process to decolonize your institution. That means one demand, a process, led by who? The people. Whom exactly? Stakeholders. Around what? Seven points. Mm -hmm. Meaning worker democracy, you know, funding, um, whatever it is that you need to name within that framework. But what it does, because demands do multiple things. We, what we demand of each other, what we demand of power, but demands communicate a politics. A dem demands are about imagination. So with the Guggenheim, when we actually took over the Guggenheim and shut it down and they lost over $100,000, and then we, had, we were able to meet with the board of directors and trustees and push these agendas, two things can be learned from that. One of them is that we always need to find modes of leverage. It may not be a specific group, but we, if we're in an ecosystem of love and care and togetherness, then we can reinforce and amplify, and we can actually do this. The other thing that, that mattered is that we chose three demands. We said, because it was in relation to migrant laborers who are actually indebted servants in Abu Dhabi building the Guggenheim because they do a franchise. They sell their name and then they do all this stuff. So, but what we said is like a debt jubilee, Right, meaning that workers, when they come, they they don't sell their land, they don't pawn their gold, their their gold, and then they they show over here three day three years to work to build for nothing in order to just pay off their debt. And then we said the right for workers to organize, right, and and something else. The point is, is like with the debt jubilee, that would have been easy. The right for workers to organize is something almost impossible because they don't want rights for workers to organize in Abu Dhabi. So maybe there's, I'm just kind of, these are like, what are the things that people care about? What is the politics that they reflect? How can then they put into a specific situation? And then it reinforces. That's all I have to say, but it's, it's all doable. But going off of what you just said in terms of like creating a seven point plan, there are eight of us here. All right, and we've got ten, uh, nine minutes left. Can we go around, like, go around the squares, so to speak? Each of us with our uh, our point to add to this list. I'll start creating our own sustainable ecosystem outside the traditional arts framework that affords us the space and the support to do our work independently and collectively. I'll pass it to Annie next. Um, invest in community wealth being beyond just survival of uh, general operating, but in community um, structures um, owned and run by community. Oh, I'm passing it to Annie. I, I, I can't, I don't know which square I am. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kimmy. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> uh, liberate the endowments, put the money in the hands of the community and the folks closest to the issues at hand, not just for the immediate crisis, but to build their own economies within each other so they will be self-serving and self-sufficient. And who are you passing it to? Kim? The YK. I am all about creating internal self-sustainable mechanisms to perpetuate the work without the need for 
external support and to create cross movement, cross organizational systems. Um, I will pass it to Alejandra. Oh, you're on. I was oh. muted. I was, I was, you know, web, web event bingo. I did, I did the thing. Um, a world where the value of our arts workers is not tied to their productivity. Who are you tossing it to? Michelle. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, centering the most impacted people at all points of decision making and trust the communities know what is best for them now and in the future. And did everybody, did I, I, I am sorry, I haven't been keeping track of who's going. <laughs> in an <eye> you left. <laughs> Melody, who did you, you name? Went? Who did she name? I'll go. I'm trying to I'll figure go. out. Yeah. <laughs> Amin, Amin and I, well, Amin started, yes? I think Amin started. Um, as we're talking about, as we talk about tearing down monuments, we don't need to build more monuments that look like their models. Our monuments are our institutions. We are the gems in our communities. Fund our organizations as the monuments that we are. Thank you. Marta? In the legend. Exactly. In the Hi. legend. Hi. <laughs> we hope we made y'all proud. <laughs> we are so proud. I've been getting emails from the and texts from the elders saying, we ain't got to say anymore. <laughs> you all are wrong. What I want to say, first of all, thank you. Um, the A and B part of the conversation was to show the intelligence, the brilliance, the sustainability of our people against all odds. Because what we reflected over these two days is more than 60 years of struggle, right? Mm -hmm. In carrying on the uh, struggle of those that came before us. And now you will carry and others like you will continue to carry. And I think that Amin's statement in terms of all the successes we have, have to be bridged because that's what freedom looks like. It's not a McDonald's package. Mm -hmm. It is all the successes that we have had, all the experiences that we have had, and the knowledge base that all of us have brought from our cultures, from our ancestors, from those who came before us and have carried that legacy. So that we represent the world, we represent the globe. And therefore, whatever we come up with and whatever we design reflects that globe. It doesn't reflect one group as being superior. It doesn't reflect one aesthetic as being superior or one educational school system or one curriculum as being superior. We have developed it all within our institutions and we have to lift it. And whoever wants to relate to us has to lift who we are and what we are and what we represent. And yes, reparation time is here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for coming through. Y'all are fire. <laughs> yes, fire. <laughs> Wonderful. And we will continue this in our other conversations coming up. The next conversation is about unifying um, all of our movements, right? And in that process, weaving us together. So we see you in the next panel, which is up and the schedule is up. So mark your calendars. So you can be part of unifying conversation and the bridging conversation and what freedom looks like for us. Next Tuesday, October 13th. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a good evening. And we'll continue. This is a movement. This is not a one time, two time conversation. We're family and the family continues. <laughs> 
Bye.